Thank you.
Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. We are glad all of you are here and the people that are in the audience. We, glad, we are glad you're here as well and looking forward to uh, just enjoying the folks online and enjoying the folks in person. We're glad uh, to be here. We want to start off as we usually do with a song and it's an old song and it has to do with uh, the object and the subject of our prayer, which we're going to be talking about tonight as prayer. And uh, we need to remember that Jesus has done everything for us. He has paid our pardon. He has uh, uh, died on the cross for us. He's forgiven our sins. He's carried those sins to the grave and buried them in the ground. And he has been resurrected so that we will be resurrected with him. So this is a song about that. come to our time where we lift up our prayer request tonight and uh, I want to add to that list a young lady named Candace who's sorting through some things so we want to pray for her also um, are there other requests that you have that you want to lift up Right, uh, Denver Sasser, and I know him well, and uh, he is well remembered because he he kind of pushed the snowball of CR here off the top of the hill, and 
it's been rolling down that hill and going up some hills ever since. So it's been it's been it's been great. And uh, Chris Kirkland, the barber. And, and son, oh, okay. Okay, good. Chris Kirkland. Okay. Are there others? Well, let's keep all the people on our prayer list in prayer. And tonight we want to make sure that we uh, pray fervently because Sally is going to talk to us in a few minutes about prayer and about the importance of prayer and about uh, petitioning to God. And before I talk about uh, all these people and pray for them, I want to remind you that prayer in the biblical sense is laying things before the Lord. It's basically saying to the Lord, we know you keep your promises and we know you fulfill your promises and we lay these things before you and the word kind of means that it kind of means uh, uh, almost it's almost an offering of trust and so as we go to the Lord tonight let's go to him with our offering of trust for what he is about to do and how he's going to deal with all these things because we don't have any good uh, good plans for that but but Jesus has great plans for those things Lord we come to you tonight thanking you for all the good things that you've done in our lives and our hearts and our community and uh, we ask Lord that you be with all the things that are floating around uh, uh, we prayed Sunday for our organ in the sanctuary and uh, they found a guy about uh, an hour away that could come and he could fix it and uh, after crawling all around all of the nooks and crannies in the sanctuary he was able to get the organ fixed so we were excited about that because we needed to hear and play the organ for our uh, Easter music, for our Palm Sunday music. And we know, Lord, that that music is also an offering to you. So we thank you for that answered prayer. And we ask you to be with all these people that we've lifted up that are far more important than the, uh, the organ or any of the other equipment in this church. We pray, Lord, for the children who are singing just about a stone's throw from here, and they're preparing to sing Sunday, and that's going to be a beautiful time of sharing. And so we look forward to them singing and, and sharing music with us, and we look forward to the choir, Lord, doing the same thing. And we ask you to prepare them and help them with uh, having the right hearts as they come in and they sing, and they remember that they're singing to you, and they're singing about this wonderful God who rode into Jerusalem as uh, a symbol of the Prince of Peace and as the uh, King of Kings. And we are excited about that as we prepare for that music. We also ask, Lord, that uh, you pray for Chris and for Denver and uh, for this young lady that uh, we lifted up earlier. Uh, take good care of each of them, Lord. Uh, they all need different things, but they all need you. And so we ask you, Lord, to just make your presence known. And tonight, as Sally comes and shares with us, make your heart known through her. And uh, we just look forward to what uh, good things you're doing, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I've shared with you before, uh, we're studying spiritual disciplines, and uh, uh, some of us who, are, who dealt with athletics all of our lives understand that there are disciplines. There are things you do to practice. Uh, uh, when I played football, you had to learn the routes to run as a receiver, and if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, your team did not uh, gain that yardage because you didn't catch that pass. Or you may be in the wrong place at the wrong time and the quarterback is uh, inundated by the, by the defensive part of the other team. And so uh, it is important for us to be disciplined in the way that we deal with God because that's much more important than a football game or a basketball game. It's much more important for us to look at these things that we can do that can make the connection between us and God uh, closer. Uh, the Celtic people 
would have called, I think, all of the spiritual disciplines thin places. And what they meant by that was that the thin place was something that made the distance between heaven and earth less. And so there are these places where uh, you can almost touch heaven. Rich Mullins uh, talked about the stars and he said sometimes the night is so beautiful that you think you can reach up and touch those stars. And he talked about that being like his relationship with God and how those are some of the times he would look up and he would see the beauty of the stars and the beauty of nature and, and, and the beauty of God's creation. And he would look up and say, you know, these are the times when I can, I can almost touch you and I can almost hear your voice. So Sally, come and uh, Sally Ezell is going to come and tell us a little bit about what her view of prayer is. And uh, we are excited to hear what you have to say. Well, last week, Randy asked me if I would do a testimony on one of uh, the spiritual disciplines. And so I chose prayer, which is kind of funny because I don't think that I'm very good at it, especially praying out loud in a group. I remember the first time that I was asked to pray out loud. It was by Ray Kelly, our preacher at the time, and he called on me to pray. Well, I got through it somehow, but was mortified and pretty ticked off that he had put me on the spot like that. But Ray Kelly had a, a way of kicking me out of my comfort zone and putting me into a position to where I could grow, and he certainly did at that time. I'm still a little self-conscious uh, when I have to pray out loud, even uh, when I say the blessing before a meal. Sometimes I finish and I think, well, did I even mention the food? So anyway, I do pray a lot, and I have been always interested in the subject of prayer. I've done a lot of reading on the topic, and I've certainly seen many answers to prayer. I've learned over the years that it's not how eloquent I am, but how honest and authentic I am. Am I distracted? Sometimes. Am I all there in my time of prayer and meditation? I try to be. I begin every day with a quiet time of Bible study, prayer, and meditation. I like to get er up early with no TV and any other distractions. I sit in the same room, in the same chair, and many days I light a candle just to remind me of the Holy Spirit's presence. I always include the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, either at the beginning or the end of my time. This year, I'm doing a study on the Psalms and have realized that most of them are really just prayers to God that I can pray to. Anne Graham Lotz talks about her struggles with prayer in her book called The Light of His Presence, Prayers to Draw You Near to the Heart of God. In her introduction to the book, she says that she struggles as I do with concentration, consistency and content, what to say and how to say it. She writes a whole book of prayers dealing with just about every subject. So if Billy Graham's daughter can, has struggled with prayer, I guess it's okay if I have my struggles also. Mainly, prayer is talking with God and listening. Unfortunately, I normally talk more than I listen. Mother Teresa says, God is the friend of silence, so I try to clear my mind so that I can hear him. At the end of my morning quiet time, I ask the Lord to go with me, to be with me throughout all the day and help me do what I need to do. Paul says, pray without ceasing and be persistent in prayer and in every situation be thankful and continually give thanks to God, for this is God's will. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Jesus taught us to pray and commands us to pray. He made a habit of going away by himself to pray to his Father to be refreshed and renewed. So if Jesus needed that, certainly we need to do it also. How do we pray without ceasing? 
Is that even possible? I think it means we should strive to be in a spirit of prayer as much as possible. St. Augustine gives this advice. Whatever you do, do well, and you praise God. Do you transact business? Do no wrong, and you praise God. Do you till your field? Raise no strife, and you praise God. In the innocence of your works, prepare to praise God all day long. I believe if we have the desire to do God's will in rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks continually, we will get better at it. This may mean, as it does in my life, most of the time I'm um, doing little short cries of desperation, help me now, Lord, or please help me see what you see, or oh, Lord, thank you so much. I find myself praying little short prayers like this many times during the day. Dallas Willard says prayer is talking with God about what we are doing together. I love that because I need him, the Holy Spirit, doing the things that I do and him leading and guiding me every minute of every day. There are many prayers in the scriptures. Jesus gave us instructions on prayer and taught us to pray in what we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. He also prays for himself, his disciples, and us in John 17. Paul prays a very powerful prayer in Ephesians 3, 16 through 21. And of course, David's Psalm 51 is a beautiful prayer asking for forgiveness. Each of these prayers we can pray too. When you pray scriptures, you know you are praying God's will and you will have your petitions answered. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That is a very powerful promise. There's a wonderful chapter on prayer in John Ortberg's book, The Life You've Always Wanted, Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People. He says prayer is learned behavior. Nobody is born an expert at it, and no one ever masters prayer. He talks about simple prayer. Jesus taught it when he tells us to pray for our daily bread. Simple prayer is the most common type of prayer in scripture. Dallas Willard again says sometimes prayer simply dies from effort to pray about good things that honestly do not matter to us. We need to get real with God and as C.S. Lewis puts it, we must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. We need to get honest. He knows anyway. The Psalms are full of honesty and getting real. Intercessory prayer is another type of prayer that Jesus taught us. He summarized it as persistence in parables of a nagging widow before a judge and a needy neighbor asking for food at midnight. I love the verse in Matthew 7 about how God, who is a good father, giving good gifts to his children who keep on asking him. We have an intercessors group that meets on Tuesdays at our church, and we've been meeting for several years. We intercede on our, for our world, our country, state, city, church, and have been persistent for many years now. We've seen prayer, prayers answered in wonderful ways. One that stands out in my mind is the prayer that we prayed for at least five years for a pianist, and then God sent us Andy Martin. What an answer. We've seen healings, rebellious children come around, successful ministries, and much more that I'm sure we'll never know about. And I happen to be in the room with several of these intercessors, and um, so we have certainly seen a lot of prayers answered. Uh, there's a little story about intercessory prayer in this book uh, about the spiritual disciplines, about Tony Campola and one of his um, 
adventures in prayer. And I think it's really good. It's short, so I, I just want to read it real quickly. One of my favorite stories about intercessory prayer comes from Tony Campola. A prayer meeting was held for him just before he spoke at a Pentecostal college chapel. Eight men took Tony back to the, to the back room in the chapel, had him kneel, laid their hands on his head, and began to pray. That's a good thing, Tony wrote, except they prayed for a long time. And the longer they prayed, the more tired they got. And the more tired they got, the more they leaned on his head. I want to tell you that when eight guys are leaning on your head, it doesn't feel so good. To make matters worse, one of the men was not even praying for Tony. He went on and on praying for somebody named Charlie Stolfus. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know that trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. Tony said he wanted to inform the prayer that it was not necessary to furnish God with directional material. Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something, God. Bring that family back together. Tony writes that he finally got the Pentecostal preachers off his head, delivered his message, and got in his car to drive home. As he drove on to the Pennsylvania Turnpike, he noticed a hitchhiker. I'll let him tell it from there. We drove a few minutes and I said, Hey, my name's Tony Campola. What's yours? He said, My name's Charlie Stolfus. Well, I couldn't believe it. I got off the turnpike at the next exit and headed back. He got a bit, bit uneasy with that, and after a few minutes he said, Hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes and asked why. I said, Because you just left your wife and three kids, right? That blew him away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. With shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off of me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer. When I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, How did you know I lived here? I said, God told me. When he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, You're back, you're back. He whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. Then I said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk, and you two are going to listen. And man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led those two young people to Christ. So prayer changes things. Your intercessory prayer matters. You don't know how many people have been strengthened because you asked God to encourage them or how many people have been healed because you prayed for them. We may never know the true effect of our prayers, but as Walter Wink says, history belongs to the intercessors, those who believe and pray the future into being. One of the greatest comforts I have comes from knowing that Jesus, our greatest intercessor, is pleading constantly to God, my Father, for me and mine. It says so in Romans 8:34. So many times my prayer is, Lord, please just work it out because I just don't know how to pray in every situation. A great intercessory tool is the book, Prayers That Avail Much. It's based on James 5:16, which says the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous believer is able to accomplish much. And there are lots of good prayers in this book. Catherine Marshall, one of my favorite authors, wrote the book Adventures in Prayer that I've read over and over. And in it she says, I believe that the old cliche, God helps those who help themselves, is not only misleading but often dead wrong. My most spectacular answers to prayers have come when I was so helpless, so out of control as to be able to do nothing at all for myself. Chapters in this book include the prayer of helplessness, the prayer that helps your dreams come true, the waiting prayer, the prayer of relinquishment, and more. Even our old hero John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote and preached on the most important of prayer, as a spiritual discipline. He said, all who desire the grace of God are to wait for it first in the way of prayer. 
and that prayer is the most useful of all pastimes. He spoke about congregational prayer, family prayer, and secret prayer in the closet. The book, How to Pray, the best of John Wesley on prayers, includes many of his writings. I've just scratched the surface of this big, huge, important topic of prayer, but I encourage you to dig just a little deeper in the study of prayer, and of course, in your, in your personal prayer and intercessory prayer. It is the key to a more loving and abundant life. I've grown in my faith through the years, practicing the spiritual disciplines, concentrating at times on each one of them. Each one draws me closer to Christ and makes me see and appreciate what a great and good God that we have. I've grown from someone with a long grocery list of needs and wants to complete trust in him so that now my most fervent prayer is, Lord, thy will be done. Because if it's his will, I'm good with it. Thank you for letting me share. That was great. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of other just short things about prayer, and I want to teach you a word, and it's uh, I'm going to do my best to pronounce it. It is pros ekomai, and it's the Greek word for prayer. And the first part of that word means toward. It means that we face God and we pray. And as I thought about that, I thought about the story about the two men who were in the church praying uh, in, in the Bible. If you remember that story, there is a sinner that's down at the altar. He's on his knees and he's saying, uh, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And there's another man in the back that's a leader in the church that's uh, a Pharisee. And he's basically saying, Lord, thank God that I am not like other men. Two different prayers, but yet which one of those people has, is facing God in that prayer? Uh, one of my favorite songs from this group called Hillsong is uh, from, uh, they sing it out in the uh, Israeli desert. And uh, as they're singing this song, it, it talks about how to touch the sky. And as I first heard the title of that song, I thought about, well, you touch the sky, first thing you do is you kind of look up because you want to look up at what you're touching. And the theme of the song is that I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. And I thought about that story of the man who is on his knees and, and facing God. How do we face God? I think we face God in submission and humility and thanksgiving. Sally touched on a number of these. The other part of that word means those things. It means, it means submission and it means uh, the, the giving of thanks and it means the, uh, the petitioning God not for what I want, but petitioning God for his will for our lives. And, uh, you've heard me say this before, and you'll, you'll hear me say it again. Uh, the people that come talk to me often ask me that question, what is God's will for my life? And when they ask that question about what is God's will for my life, what I want to say to them, and what I usually do say to them is, it's the wrong question. It's the wrong question because what we want to know in praying and in all of the spiritual disciplines we've talked about is not something about me. Not what is God's will for me. You, you know, because there's a selfishness embedded in that question. Uh, what is God going to do for me? What does God want me to do? Uh, uh, I'm waiting for instructions because I'm important and God wants me to do something. 
uh, what we really should be saying is, Lord, show me what is happening in your will and show me where in that will I can participate, I can jump in. Uh, uh, Sally gave a great example of that as we prayed for someone to come and be a pianist at the church. And uh, we started praying for that the day I walked in the door uh, over eight years ago. The day I walked in the door, that was one of the big needs. And I went to the staff parish relations team and we talked about it and we prayed about it and we advertised. We did everything humanly possible. And it was five years and we had tried everything we knew. And one Sunday, a gentleman came in that back door and he sat in the back on the right, I can still tell you where he sat. And I said, I've not seen that gentleman before. And so after church service, I started talking to him and it was Andy Martin. And we just talked and we shared and we got along well just in that little conversation. And God blessed that. And God answered that prayer. And uh, if you know how music works at church, you know, how, you know music isn't always easy and it isn't always a simple thing. And uh, they're preparing for the Easter musical right now. And that's, uh, that's, it's work, isn't it, Sally? Because you got to go and you got to practice. But to get someone who has surgery a, a, about a week ago and was here yesterday supervising the person who was coming to fix our organ and was interested enough in our music to do that. Uh, money can't buy that. that. That is heart. That is, uh, you know, that's the person on your team. You say, you know, that person may not be the best player on my team. But that person is the heart and soul of the team because they're the glue that, that fits everything together. And so uh, it was exciting to see that prayer answered. And that happened not because of any ability we had. That didn't happen because uh, somebody that Sunday went out and invited Andy to the church. That happened, I think, because God said, I'm going to answer your prayer, but I'm going to see how persistent you are, and then I'm going to answer it in my time. Those who wait upon the Lord will mount up on wings like eagles, and they will run and not get weary and walk and not get tired. And I think about that verse a lot as I'm saying it at funerals, and I'm thinking what a life verse that is. It's not just a verse about death, but it's a verse about living life in the will of God. And what God wants for us through that prayer is to say, Lord, um, I want to know what your will is. I want to find what that will is because where your will is is going to be great things for me. It's going to be great things for this church. And so we're praying that a lot right now, and we're seeing some things happen and unfold, and some of them are are difficult because uh, some of them are major projects that have to happen in order for us to repair things. Uh, and then some of them are going to be, I think, some of the, the most fun projects we have, at the, have had at this church in a long time. As we begin to prepare this place for children that about six months ago, we didn't have a lot of those children here, but now we're starting to see some children pop in here and they're singing and we're having an egg hunt next week. Uh, see, I didn't forget you. Uh, we're, we're, we're having an egg hunt next week out at, uh, at, 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 in, in front of the uh, houses in Rain Tree. There's a big circle there. And uh, we're going to hide eggs and we're going to cook hot dogs and we're going to have a good time. We're going to start at 11 o'clock on the day before Easter. So, uh, so uh, I think it's the 3rd of April, 11 o'clock. Come and just enjoy it. Bring kids, grandkids, uh, neighbors' kids. Let's have a good time. And let's remember that it isn't all about the egg hunt. And it isn't all about the candy that they get in the eggs. 
Because we're going to tell them the Easter story. We're going to make sure they know that the reason we're there is because we have a Savior named Jesus Christ who paid it all and all to him we owe. Our sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Let's go to him now in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for your forgiveness because I need it. I need it every day and I, I renew my need for forgiveness every day, unfortunately. But you are good and faithful and you are persistent and you remember our prayers. And you unfold things that we never even knew about, never even heard about, and yet they're, they're wonderful things. So, Lord, uh, here we are on our knees again, and we're facing you, whether we're looking at the ground, whether we have our eyes closed, whether we're praying with our hands in the air, whether uh, we're lying down in a prone position praying, whatever we're doing, Lord, if we're offering up to you our face toward your face. However that happens, I don't think you're particularly worried about. But Lord, teach us as we pray to listen for what you are calling us to do. Because often when we pray and ask you to do things, you're asking us to be the tools you use to do those things. We pray for a young lady where well, you're going to use us to help that young lady and so we're going to try to do our best to do that and we're going to try to lead that person to a place where they'll get some help and and Lord you told us to pray for all of these things that we laid before you these illnesses and Lord we don't know how to heal those things but you do and you know how to send doctors and nurses and medicines and Lord Sometimes when we pray to you and we lay things down before you and we don't get the answer we want, we get upset. But give us the ability to trust you with everything in our lives, the people we love, the, the things that we hold dearest to us. Let us lay them before you and let us ask you the question, Lord, what is your will? What is your will for these things? What is your will for these people? What is your will for me? And, and then let us be attentive to listening for that answer. Sally said that so well. Uh, silence is definitely part of our prayer life. Too often we don't listen. So Lord, as we leave here, I'm going to ask us to go and if we get in our car, Turn the radio off. Let us listen. If we walk down to one of the rooms in the church and want to just sit and pray, I pray, you, Lord, that you will open our ears, close our mouths, and let us hear what you have for us. Because it is in that silence sometimes we learn the most. And as we do all that, Lord, whatever good you bring from it, we give it to you. And we give you the glory for the good because you are a good God and you give us good things and you want good things for your children. Thank you for everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Go in peace and may the God of peace go with you. Amen.